So, you want to work in a zoo? Well, you're in the right place. We're going to be talking to zookeepers, researchers, conservationists and many more people about their careers. We will discuss how they got into doing what they do now and of course we'll be asking them for their advice to those that aspire to work with animals or for animals and the natural world. So we wanted to have a chat to the people who've got the weird jobs at the zoo. I think a lot of people know about the classic zoo jobs like zookeeper and also our gardeners. But what about the jobs that happen behind the scenes that you didn't know about, that you had no idea existed? Yeah, there's a huge amount that goes into running a zoo. Um, you know, it, People don't realise just how involved it is, even just moving animals or deciding what happens day to day or all the little extra things that we have to do to have mm -hmm. the licensing and things like that. So it's, yeah, it's just those jobs that don't immediately spring to mind, but are actually incredibly important in every zoo. So obviously a bit of a different episode. That's why you've got all three of us sat here. That's not going to be the same throughout uh, the episode either. So obviously we're going to be talking to different people. We've got three guests on today. So we talk about who we're going to be chatting to. Matt, who are you going to talk to? Well, so you wouldn't expect to find a graphic designer at a zoo. So we've got Kerry from our creative studio coming on. And I think she's going to be able to shine a light on how you make... Uh, I use graphic design to improve the way we get our conservation message across. So hopefully some interesting chat there. When we were thinking about this episode, one of the people we we're very keen to talk to is our registrar, mm -hmm. Sarah, Okay, who is involved with a lot of the paperwork. And it'd be really easy to think that somebody who's doing paperwork is going to be have a boring job. But actually her job's like really critical to the zoo. Yeah. And it makes the moves, animal moves happen. So that should be a, a very good, interesting chat. And Joe, what about you? Who are you talking to? So I'm going to be talking to Holly, who um, her official title is research manager, but she's involved um, in all sorts of other things with the uh, animal welfare and enrichment. Um, and she links with Sarah as well in that she um, coordinates a particular species, um, something called a stub book as well, which obviously we'll find out a bit more about when we speak to Sarah and to Holly. So... Ollie, I think that the first guest that we should maybe talk to would be Sarah, our mm -hmm. registrar. So let's start with the paperwork and then we'll move on to other fields of the zoo. <laughs> when we were looking at weird jobs here at the zoo, Sarah, I was really keen to talk to you because I know you've got a job that other people would not expect us to have here at the zoo. So can, first off, can you tell us your name and what do you do for a job here? Uh, yeah, I'm Sarah and I'm the zoological registrar. Okay, and zoo. you're a keeper as well, right? Yeah, yeah, part-time uh, registrar and part-time keeper. Okay, right, so if I think of the word registrar, then I'm thinking of weddings and deaths and things like that. But what, is that, what do you do here at the zoo? What does your day consist of? Yeah, no weddings, um, entirely animal records and animal movements. So right, I coordinate okay. animal moves and organise all our records on a database that we use go globally okay so if we're saying animal moves that's us moving animals to another zoo and other zoos sending animals to us as part of our breeding programs yeah yeah okay so you're at a computer um or? mostly a computer yeah in okay probably 95 percent of the time at a right, computer. Okay. so day to day you come in uh you're on a day as a registrar not as a day as a keeper so like what are the jobs that you're going to be doing during a day uh, so I'll be managing the online record system, which we call ZIMS. Okay. It means uh, Zoological Information Management System. Okay. And that's used globally mm -hmm. by thousands of zoos all yeah. around the world. We share data to a certain extent with other zoos, um, but it's mostly so we can look at all of our animals' data on a day-to-day -day right. basis. Right, okay, so... Having, I've only ever looked at Zims and used it to see how old an animal is. So, but but for people who are not in the zoo world, basically you can look on it and if you know an animal's name or ID number, you can find out how old it is and if the keepers have had notes and where it was born and who it's related to. Yeah. Is it reasonable to say it's basically animal Facebook? Yeah, But dialed back a bit. Okay. They're yeah. not sharing things, but we can share on their behalf. Yeah, and okay. it's their day-to-day -day diary. It's everything that's happening to them in the day. It's mm -hmm. when they were born, it's when they die, um, it's when they move on, all of that sort, sort of stuff's recorded alongside all their ancestry. So it's uh, sort okay. of, it's tons of things. It could be their diets um, added into it, the temperatures of their enclosures might be added to it, where they live in the zoo is yeah. on there, how okay, they were also, reared. Like it's, it's everything about that animal if you want to know it it could be on You'll that profile. Yeah, so if, for example, we had just moved a 
lion to another zoo, <laughs> okay, so which we have done, is that then the keepers at the new zoo would find out that his name is Yali and they'd know certain things about how to look after him, right? So the important management notes, but also the actual, you know, maybe... Uh, his quirks. His quirks, and, yeah, and his yeah. Yeah, food. so his profile now I have sent over. So Yali's okay. profile I'll send over to the zoo in Ireland. Yeah. And they'll have all the information that we have ever kept on him. All his medical records, all his notes and observations, his weight records, you know, foods that he likes, foods that he doesn't. Okay, and, um, mm, brilliant. All sorts. So you're the, you're taking all that information and enter it into Zim's making sure it's update, updated. Like, so it is, it is like Facebook, isn't it? I'd never thought <laughs> yeah. of that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah a little Just bit. For, for those that don't really yeah. know the... Like, Did he have a season, single status? On Facebook, oh, well, no. un until not. until recently, yeah. Okay, so now he's changed his status from single to yeah. Hmm? It's complicated. Okay, because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> he's got That's two quite a girlfriends. Good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. He's got two girlfriends. Yeah, over okay. a photo. Right. I did not know. So, so Yali the lion has gone to photo in County Cork in yes. Ireland. Yeah. And now he's got two females. Yes. There. Oh, okay. And so, if they ever happen to breed, that will all go on there. His offspring will be logged on there. They'll have their own profiles. And right. It just sort of goes on and on, and we build this huge picture of what's going on in okay. the world of zoos. So you that would be part of your job. What mm -hmm. else do you do in a in a day with um, registrar work? So it's coordinating moves as well. So okay. that is organising the moves between us and, say, that zoo in yeah. Ireland, but it could be zoos in Singapore and okay. all across Europe and some just within the UK as well. Right, so international moves, we've just moved to Hornbill to Singapore, yeah, right? Yeah. So, are we, is, I mean, are we talking a lot of permits and... Yeah, don't... yeah, so uh, <laughs> we need CITES, which are your Because you're moving permits. endangered species, yeah. yeah. endangered species permits. Um, you're dealing with animal plant and health over here, so you're trying to figure out what testing this animal needs before right. it leaves the country, coordinating with the country that's receiving the animal yeah, and trying to figure out w what testing they want and pairing that with what we're willing to do. Yeah, so and that's it's quite sort important. Of, right? Yeah, because being if, the middleman. Yeah, if, you're, if you had an animal like a hornbill arriving in an airport and he didn't have the correct paperwork and getting stuck there, then that could be a risk for the animal. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what registrars are here to okay. stop happening. Yeah. We're smooth. here to make sure that everything runs smoothly between the government authorities and the zoos that are doing the move yeah. and yeah. everyone in between. So you don't get an animal <laughs> stuck at a border. And that's really important for us, right? So Wild Planet Trust, we're trying to help halt species decline. And part of that is uh, having coordinated breeding programs between mm -hmm. zoos and other collections. So we're going to be part of a lot of breeding programs. So yeah. um, with Yali, for example, when we're moving the lion, he's uh, an Asiatic lion, so endangered species. Mm -hmm. So quite an important move. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, anything that's related to a, a EEP, so yeah. the ERs or ex situ breeding programs, is always going to be an important move. Whether you're moving an animal just to be a companion, that's still taking part in that program and I'm serving a purpose. But with the wrinkled hornbill, for example, we were moving it on because eventually a male will be sent there and they'll be really important breeding mm. Okay, pair. so, so, so. Get the, our male, uh, sorry, our female goes, the male comes from another collection and then hopefully the magic happens. That's cool. That's um, <laughs> right, uh, uh, job as a registrar, like, did you set out to be a registrar? I didn't. No, so. it was more a chance encounter. Okay. So oh, okay. I had started working at Living Coast as mm -hmm. a keeper. I was there part-time. So Living Coast was the coastal zoo and aquarium that Wild Planet Trust used to operate, yeah. which has since closed, partly because of COVID. But So you worked as a keeper there. Yes. Looking after what? Uh, everything. Okay. I was a bit of a float keeper, so I worked between the penguins, the aquarium, the fur seals, seals okay. um, puffins and the wading birds, a bit of everything. Okay. Um, and I was approached because the registrar role was being advertised here and the person who approached me thought I might be interested in it. Okay. So... Yeah, I took a bit of a gamble, went for it, and ended up being quite passionate about okay, uh, yeah. records and data. And what's your, what do you really like about your job? What's your favourite bit? Um, I think it's the working across departments. Okay. I get to, you know, dabble in a bit of birds and a bit yeah. of mammals and a bit of reptiles and amphibians, and you get this sort of broad knowledge. You're not 
just yeah. narrowed down like I've got my days as a keeper where I really focus on primates yeah but then I still get all this other knowledge that comes through just looking on zims or recording stuff on zims and seeing what other people and other departments are recording about their animals yeah mm. and you sort of know the ins and outs of what's going on okay, in so the zoo, zoo in gossip in a way that other people might not necessarily know it's just yeah okay. it's interesting, interesting. It's the definition yeah. of insider knowledge yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gossip knows exactly what's going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely the the other registrars across the UK were quite yeah. a close knit group. Okay, we all get together and sometimes. We get together <laughs> just like usually once a year, sometimes yeah. outside of that, but they're so supportive and so knowledgeable and mm. I think they're like the unsung heroes in zoos. They just do so much work and it's quite an isolated job yeah. because no one else knows what you're doing yeah that's why i guess it is a weird job no one else knows what it entails yeah and when we if i, if I asked a little kid what jobs happen at a zoo people would say zookeeper they might say gardener they wouldn't i don't think they would expect like registrar or you know coordinating international animal mm -hmm. moves um i suppose one question to change topic a little bit is what, what are the challenges what, what's difficult about your job trying to make everyone else as passionate about what you find interesting yeah. when i talk about it in a conversation like this it sounds like animal records and no really was... interesting really exciting and why wouldn't people get on board is it because but you're... when well, people they're... are zoo keeping yeah. and you're getting your hands dirty and you're yeah. stuck into a task like animal records is just something that you write yeah. at the end of the yeah. day it's not something that is all encompassing and what you're thinking about yeah. whereas i'm trying to think well what data do we want to collect what can we do with that and how will that improve yeah. our husbandry going forward? We want them to be a record of what we're doing right, but also what we're doing wrong yeah. and how can we improve and how can that feed into so many other yeah. things? Like it feeds into conservation inherently. Um, what we're recording on Zims is used globally to inform, you know, the illegal wildlife trade and okay. filling in gaps in... Uh, like species knowledge like there's so much that we're collecting on yeah. there on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. that people think it's really mundane like entering your animal's weight or what it's eaten yeah. or the enclosure that it's being kept in but somebody's doing something with that data like yeah. people are using that data to carry out research okay so Go on. <laughs> serious point. yeah it's a very serious point to touch on that point a bit further do you find yourself working with like the research department quite a bit here or in other zoos do they often reach out or is it kind of packaged for them through zims a little bit because you'll get research requests mm -hmm. quite often and there is a lot of stuff that i can answer through our zims records yeah. sometimes it's a case of you can click a button and share access with them uh, okay. and then the researchers can get what data they yeah. need sometimes it's answering the questions that they're sending you um, but yeah, we work with the research department or everything that comes as a request to myself. Yeah. I forward on and then that sort of gets approved through our research department as to whether we can get involved or whether yeah. we're maybe already involved. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's certain places where they're going to want to really push the research, right? And yeah, like yeah. priorities at the moment. So Sarah, to ask a question that we ask all our guests, can you tell me about the weirdest job is that you've ever done? Uh, yeah. Um, I worked in a sausage factory. Okay. It was probably my shortest lived job. Okay, how long are we talking? A day and a, a half. And oh, half. wow. <laughs> okay, right, okay. Very quick. Um, you didn't like it? Quick in and out. wasn't a fan. Right, no, okay. I had to grab six sausages off the line and put them in a pack, and that right. was essentially my day. Okay. Oh, and then the second day was wrapping pigs in blankets, so... Okay, right. Yeah. I didn't know wow. that was a job either. But yeah, that's a, that's a job. Right, okay. So Not one for me. That's something that you take for granted when you go to the supermarket. Yeah. It turns <laughs> out that somebody in a factory has been wrapping those yeah. by hand. I went on which a you don't tour. Which you realise that was Sarah for a day a, and a half. I went on a tour of a <laughs> seafood processing factory once. Yeah. And I met, met the, the people who were basically skinning and filleting fish. And mm -hmm. you just have to admire the fact, the patience and the skill. But it's that's not, I can't do that. So one thing to ask you is, have you got any advice for your 15-year-old self? So if you could go back now, would you still work in conservation? Would you? I like to think I would. Yeah. I I have a passion for it and I can't see now. I can't see what else I'd do. Yeah. Um, 
I guess my advice would be probably get more hobbies and okay. do more <laughs> whilst right. you're young. Yeah. Um, you know, but also just if you are going for a job, figure out what it is that you love and yeah, I think go for something that you love yeah. because it makes work a lot yeah, a lot easier. More fun. A lot easier. Uh, do, it's just you, more enjoyable. When you've changed roles, so when you've gone for new jobs or when you've changed roles within the organisation, mm -hmm. so was it experience that helped you? Was it something you'd done? Was it like helping with things or was it qualifications? Um, probably a mixture. I'd okay. say probably more the experience I have had. I did internships. Uh, I did a marine mammal stranding internship in okay. Florida. Um, that was straight out of university. Right. Okay. Then straight into a dolphin acoustic research oh, really? um, okay, in right. Hong Kong. <laughs> so okay. wow. I was at Ocean Park in Hong Kong and did some research out there as an intern. Um, a little stint at Yorkshire Wildlife Park okay. as a volunteer ranger. Yeah. So I have. It's always been animal related, but in different ways. So actually, ways. tying into that, is, did, did you study? Like, or what did you yeah, study? Yeah, uh, so I did animal biology at okay. university. Um, at A-levels, I did biology and media, I think, is okay. what I ended up coming out with. But again, A-levels was difficult for me because I just didn't have a passion yeah. to be there. I think I was done with school by that point. I was just tired of learning set subjects and I wanted to do something I was passionate yeah. about. So then when I went on to university, it yeah. sort of sparked something. So did you choose animal biology for because it interested you or because of the career you wanted out of it? Or? Um, mostly because it interested me. Okay. Partly because I could see a career coming out of it, but I didn't know what at that stage. I didn't okay. know whether it was going to be go straight to be a zookeeper yeah. or go into research mm -hmm. I didn't know what I wanted from it right okay um and it was sort of by chance that I did animal biology I'd actually gone for an open weekend for forensics right okay, at, um, okay. Nottingham yeah. University that ended and they said there's no jobs in this industry so right. I walked away going oh okay maybe I should okay. do something else and I worked at a pet shop at the time right uh, one of the girls who I spoke to there was doing a zoo biology course mm -hmm. at Nottingham Trent, and I was like, "Yeah, I could, yeah, I, could I could do, do that. That, okay. that sounds good." And now she works at York Yorkshire Wildlife Park, and okay. I work Amazing. here at Paint and Zoo. So, so a random conversation <clears throat> like, at the end of a weekend means you change from forensics to animal biology, and then yeah. you end up doing dolphin acoustic research in Hong Kong. And now here at Paint and Zoo, you're looking after the yeah paperwork. It's quite a... so everything's a bit <laughs> yeah just everything seems to have been a bit of a chance encounter hard work as well yeah, yeah but of also course. i think it's so hard to get into our industry yeah i feel like we lack diversity okay. and people from different mm. cultural backgrounds because it's just not accessible like i've yeah. been lucky that i did internships yeah mm -hmm. but they weren't paid no and I've done volunteering again. It's it's unpaid, and unless I was in a fortunate enough position, like yeah, I was in a able, fortunate, you've got to be able to. You've got to be able to yeah. afford it, like. And I just don't think that that should be the case. I think we're missing out on so a whole lot of talent. Yeah. yeah, many. Yes, I think there's been some interesting noises in the last couple of years about exactly that about people trying to um, open up careers like zookeeping to mm -hmm. be not just people who can afford to do interns and get, mm -hmm. and get the experience i think experience has been a theme that's come up with other people we've spoken to that you need to get some experience so when you go for the interview mm -hmm. and maybe that is just helping at weekends in a in a shelter or something yeah but, but even even that it's hard you're still giving up time that would have yeah. otherwise been yeah. set aside for a weekend job to, to earn some money. you know earn some yeah. money so yeah, it yeah. is it is difficult. I think something needs to change. It needs to the doors need to open a bit easier. Yeah. For people that are passionate about it. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Okay, that'd be really interesting to see. So thank you very much, Sarah, for talking to us today, and hopefully people have enjoyed learning about your job as zoo registrar. So we're now going to pass over to Joe and Holly. Yeah, so I think it ties in nicely with what we've just heard from Sarah, um, because Holly is more sort of on the ground, I suppose, um, with her stub book side of things. Um, but obviously the research, if we didn't have research, we wouldn't have a zoo because we need it for our license. So it'd be uh, good to hear from Holly now. 
Okay, so next up we have got Holly joining us in our Unusual Jobs special. So you were one of the names that sprung to mind when we were thinking of those jobs that people don't always realise goes on behind the scenes. Um, So let's start with who are you and a little kind of snapshot of what your job actually is. Okay, so hi Jo. Um, So I'm Holly. I'm the research manager for Painting Zoo and Nuki Zoo. And very basically, um, I manage all of the students that come to the zoo to study animals I also organise uh, lecturing for master's courses that we run with Plymouth and Exeter University. And I also have some other exciting areas of my job that I'm sure I can tell you about later. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, let's start by just describing a typical day. Then, What would be a typical day in your job? I don't really have a typical day, to be honest. Um, I'll probably come in, make a cup of tea and open my inbox to see what awaits me. Uh, so it kind of depends where we are in the year. So certain parts of the year maybe academically I'll be um, working on coordinating um, members of our staff who give lectures for our zoo conservation biology masters that we run with Plymouth University I'll be meeting with students to talk about how their research is going and any stats they might have to do for example Um, and part of my job also is to manage a critically endangered primate in European zoos so some of my job is also answering questions and moving animals between collections. Okay, so we should have just heard a bit about that from Sarah, because Sarah is obviously our registrar. So do you work quite closely um, with registrars at different zoos? Is that part of your role? Then? Yes, I do. Yeah, we use the same piece of software, Zims, which mm-hmm. I'm sure Sarah's talked yeah. about. Uh, so that's the basis of how we run our stud books. And then I can extract that data and put it into a genetic analysis software that I can then use to make oh, okay. decisions about who breeds. Okay, nice. so it is the, the Tinder of the zoo world then, yeah? Well, Pretty much. <laughs> just describe that with Matt, that if Zim's is the Facebook of the zoo yeah. world, then Holly's in charge of Tinder of the zoo world. <laughs> Pretty much, Ish. yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm right in saying you're um, the macaque, uh, the Sulawesi crested black macaque. So we talked to Harry earlier on in our podcast series, and obviously he's the one that does the 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 ex situ, the in situ rather population. So you're the ex situ person for them then, are you? I am, yes. So they're only managed in European zoos now, mm-hmm. so that's my job. And it's really lovely. So I have about 30 zoos that house about 220 animals at the moment. Uh, but it's great to have an in situ partner project, not only because I can um, link with them and find out what's going on in the wild, but also I can encourage zoos to try and raise money for our conservation efforts as well. Oh, cool. So how do you actually decide who goes where then? I've always wondered that. So we use a piece of software called PMX. Mm-hmm. Please don't ask me what it stands for. <laughs> uh, but basically, you can extract the data from Zims, and it basically gives you information about all the males and all the females in zoos. And then it tells you basically how important they are in terms of genetics. So they do they have lots of other relatives that have similar genetics. And then what I try and do is pair up males and females that are the least um, least similar to each other. So basically those that are the least related And then I move them or I give recommendations to move them between European Mm -hmm. zoos and hope those animals will breed with the right animals. Okay. Okay. So once you've given your recommendation, then it's over to the zoos. You don't have anything to do with the actual move then as such? No. So that's up to the registrars at those zoos. Um, But I can give guidance as to how to introduce new animals into collections, what kind of enclosures and quarantine they might need. But obviously Brexit has made it a little bit difficult for us now. So there is a bit more involvement for me just trying to get everybody uh, moving in the right direction. This podcast is brought to you by Wild Planet Trust, a conservation charity based in the southwest of the UK with zoos in Paynton and Newquay, local and national nature reserves, and field projects in the UK, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, and Sulawesi. You can find out more on our website, www.wildplanettrust.org.uk. Okay, so to get back to the research side of it, because obviously that is your official job title, what kind of research do zoos actually do? It's probably not something that many people realise we have to do. No, and research is a really big part of what Mm -hmm. we do. Uh, It underpins everything we're doing in terms of how we look after our animals, our conservation projects, if we know that our education is being effective, for Mm -hmm. example. So we do a a real real range of research here. Um, So we do a lot of work into welfare, making sure that our animals are okay, that they're happy, that any interventions like training them, enrichment, what kind of diet we give them is working and and it's the right thing to do. And we can also share that with our friends at other zoos as well. Uh, We have uh, members of staff who work on plants, so plant genetics, but also looking at um, if we plant different types of botanics in different areas, what effect that has on the ecosystem. We also have someone working on um, 
you know, potentially looking at our native species like eels and birds as well. So it really is a complete variation of what we look at. Oh, so you oversee all of that at, at both sites then? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. So not just the students that we have, but also students like to come and use our sites to collect their data. So we also make sure that what, they, what they're doing when they come is viable, but also making sure that it's in line with the mission of our zoos as well. Yeah. So... I've obviously known you for a long time because I was one of those students. You were many years <laughs> ago. Um, so that kind of leads on to how did you how did you get into your role? Because I imagine it's a fairly similar route to me, really. Kind of, yeah. yeah. So I was really interested in animals when I was younger, um, but I didn't want to be a vet. Um, I'm a bit squeamish when it comes to blood and things, so it wasn't really my avenue. So I went to university to study zoology to get a really broad background of what to do. Um, and then I worked, went to the Canary Islands to work on a whale and dolphin conservation project oh, cool. and realised that I really loved what I was doing. So then went on to do a master's in animal behaviour, um, came to the zoo and volunteered and then did my PhD at Exeter as well. So I've kind of been in academia for a very long time. Um, and that kind of is the way that the route that many yeah. of us seem to go. Cool. OK, not the route I ever want to go. <laughs> Done a master's. It was hard work. Don't want to ever do it again. I don't know how you have the patience to do a PhD. I think when you, <laughs> when you really love a subject, you're fine, but it is basically studying the same thing for a yeah. very long time. Yeah. So you've really got to love what you do. Go on, and what was your PhD on? I mean, I know the answer, but just for a basic. It was on the acoustics or the, or the sounds made by um, howler monkeys, so a South American primate that make a really charis- a charismatic howling sound. Actually, we have them at Painton Zoo on our island and working out why they make this sound and if it's important for their welfare in zoos. So that literally involved you playing sounds at them didn't it yeah i sat and watched howler monkeys sleep for um pretty much 80 percent of the day yep. and then when they howl it's really exciting for about 20 minutes and then they go back to sleep again but yeah basically <laughs> playing sounds and recording them um over about six year period just to see what's oh, wow. going on cool okay i always like asking this question i know it's not one that matt always includes but if you weren't doing what you are doing right now if you weren't working in conservation and zoos what would you be doing it's a, it's a really difficult question. I think I'd probably try and be doing something completely different. I think if mm. you really love zoos, that you kind of that's what your passion is. Um, but I'm quite creative, and I do a lot of um, craft, so um, sewing, making, embroidery, that kind of thing. So I think I'd have tried to go around some kind of artistic oh, okay. route. I think so, something pretty much completely different. But I'd probably have snuck an animal in there somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> just crafting for animals. What advice would you give your 15-year-old self? Oh wow. Um, I think if you've got a passion, just really try and do everything you can to get there. I know that's what I tell a lot of my students. Um, So volunteering, you know, Mm. I probably would have started that a little bit earlier, maybe, you know, volunteering in in animal shelters, um, you know, in catteries, even in zoos, if you can get that kind of position these days. I think it's really important to try and get as much experience as possible. Um, Yeah, that would have been a really helpful thing. Although I got here, I went down the academic route, but you can also go down the more practical route. And I think that's really good. Lovely. Okay. Anything you want to add? Uh, I'm going to add it because nobody gets away with not answering (laughs) this question. What's the weirdest job you've ever had, Holly? Oh, my word. The weirdest job. Uh, I did lots of things like lots, you know, most people did. I worked in restaurants and cafes. Um, My family friend used to own a laundrette. Uh, On every Saturday morning when I was about 15, I used to go and wash other people's duvets, which was (laughs) um, a slightly weird job, but it paid really well. Oh, fair enough. There we go. Well, thank you very much, Holly, for being on the podcast. And obviously, hopefully, you've enjoyed it. Yes, and we hope great. that everybody's enjoyed listening to what you've had to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And now for someone completely different, uh, almost completely non-animal based, apart from maybe some of the pictures they're manipulating. Who are we talking to next, Matt? Right, well, I was keen to talk to somebody from Creative Studio. And um, we've chosen Kerry, who's one of our graphic designers. I think when you're thinking about careers, lots of people would th- think about careers like graphic design, but the idea of working in conservation using graphic design is an interesting one. So let's have a chat to Kerry. Well, so Kerry, thank you very much for coming in today to talk That's to us. Okay. So we're going to start off with a standard question that we've asked a lot of our guests, which is, can you tell us the weirdest job you've ever done? Um, I haven't really had any weird jobs, but my first job that I did was a paper round. I don't think I could do paper round. It's too early mornings. It would not suit me. I think that's quite important. Like, you know, yeah. shift work, things like that, could yeah. not do. Did you find as well that the paper round got a little harder during seagull chick season? It wasn't around this area. Oh, okay. no. okay. Is that a known problem in Tor Bay? Of having... uh, well, I grew up in Timmouth, so just down the road. But right. I had a paper uh. round in seagull chick season. You'd just get swooped that. 
the entire time. Oh, right. <laughs> so, so where did you do your paper round? Uh, so I was born in Kingston in mm-hmm. southwest London, and so it was around, um, uh, I lived in okay. Tolworth. That's where I did my paper round. Okay. Um, Urban paper round. Less seagulls, more... Yeah, and more pigeons. You send us? <laughs> <laughs> A bit more exciting than probably mine. Okay. Um, but yeah, probably in the winter it's a bit difficult when it was cold yeah. and you had to get out at sort of six o'clock. That wasn't very nice. But smog. Yeah. I've heard about London smog. This so. isn't the Victorian. <laughs> 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 so moving on to more relevant questions, uh, it maybe is that maybe you can tell us what you do here at the zoo and uh, a little bit about your job. Yeah. So um, I work in the graphics department, okay. um, which I've worked in for eleven years. Um, and we do <clears throat> all the graphics for um, Painton Zoo and Nuki Zoo. Um, so we do posters, leaflets, signage. Mm-hmm. Things like, so it's all basically anything with uh, print or so colour or images. anything graphical, yeah, okay, that you see. We do, um, like, for all the different departments, we do different things. So lots of variety of jobs come in. So we can mm-hmm. be doing um, products for the shop or... Um, Okay, because you could be designing a tea towel one day and then the next day you could be designing a conference poster for one of our research students or you could be doing the leaflet. Yeah. I mean, Dave's doing the guidebook at the minute, Yeah, guidebook, badges. Yeah. So you're one of a team, right? So you've got yourself, you're a graphic designer. Yeah, so I'm a graphic designer. Who else is in your office? So Dave is our manager. Okay. We have Ollie. Okay. (laughs) The video guy. Okay. (laughs) Um, We have Jackie, she's the graphic artist. Okay. And Julie is also a graphic designer. Right, okay. And Dave is... uh, And Dave's our manager. He's manager and he's graphic designer. So, Kerry, if we went upstairs now to the graphics studio, to creative studio, and um, we looked on your computer, what have you been working on recently? Can you tell us about a project you, you've been working on? Um, yeah, one of the projects I've been working on is Sustainable Summer Campaign. Okay. Um, so there's quite a lot involved in that. Um, so from the initial posters and digital content for social media, the website, the banners... So this summer we've been trying to encourage yeah. people who visit uh, yeah. our website and, and the zoo to basically to make choices that will allow them to live more sustainably. So we've been trying to run that campaign for yeah. the summer. So for you, that means making sure the posters have got a certain look to them. Yeah, so the sort of... Um, yeah. so, like getting so, the right look, get, making it appealing. Yeah, right? so, so I know with Sustainable Summer we're all quite... Uh, we quite liked your designs because it had the summer, the, the windmill on it. Yes. That you could get a, a kid's windmill at a beach and that, of course, links into turbines yeah. and that sort of subtle um, linking allows, should yeah. hopefully improve it's the way we message, right? Giving the image of what you're trying to get across, so not just in words. You think of the images to um, get across the message. So, like, the beach was there, um, sort of beach cleans that was sort of representing mm-hmm. and the windmill, so sustainable energies um and about palm oil so there was a palm tree on there um and sort of marine plastic so we, we had the sea and fish um so it's getting across in a graphic way so if someone if children looked at it they couldn't yeah. read they could see yeah they what, get what idea, yeah, yeah they get the idea of what you're okay. trying to get across it's nice and colorful i am entirely thick because I I work here. I, work I didn't want you. to say anything. I'm involved in the Sustainable <laughs> Summer activities. We've been encouraging people yeah. to do beach cleans, and I hadn't clicked about that link. I clicked on the uh, on the windmills okay. and the turbines and how nice it was, but I hadn't clicked about, about that and the palm oil. And that's really cool because yeah. I'm yeah. sure I I think a lot of people will have clicked on on those. But I, maybe that's just me. But I, I, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's that's cool because obviously. Because there's the Sustainable Summer logo, which you did yeah. as well. So you yeah. combined all those elements into something that represents everything we're trying to portray. Because like, really the logo's got the windmills, it's got splashes of water, mm-hmm. so it all links in. So if you lose, use the logo on its own, yeah. it's got those elements in it, like you say. Okay, and that yeah. hopefully makes it more appealing to people. Yeah. And then that means that more people will hopefully pay attention to the yeah. campaign and, and actually... Well, want whether to it's reading in, the engage poster, yeah. in it, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get people to join in to well, yeah. help whole species decline, but it's basically taking little actions to, to yeah. change their lives, right? Okay, so that's quite an interesting... So part of your job is actually helping us to deliver our conservation message, yeah. right? Like, Did you expect to do that when you when you left school? What did you want to do? 
Um, I've always been very creative and into drawing and everything like that. Um, and so it was something that I would have liked to have gone down the route of. My other option was sort of childcare. Okay. So that was my two um, two options. So did but the I did graphic, choose the graphic. The graphic design and the graphic skills, did they yeah. come first and then you worked at the zoo or were you interested in animals? Um, I... I, s- I only started at the zoo as a seasonal front of house assistant. Okay. So um, that was when I decided to go back to college and do a graphic design course mm-hmm. after taking a couple of years just to have a think about what I wanted to do. So I was working at Iceland at the time and I needed a few more hours just to cover me for yeah. the summer. So I applied for the seasonal front of house. I got that and then I ended up staying at the zoo. Okay. So then I started my college um, course in graphics and then I was doing some volunteering with the graphics department here. Yeah. Right. Then I ended up covering maternity and now I'm still here. What did you study at college? Was it a, a, like a college course in graphic design? Was it? After sixth form, I did a foundation studies in art and design. So that mm-hmm. was a general sort of textiles, jewellery making, typography. Yeah, all sorts all of sorts things covered, in one. Yeah. And then I decided I didn't want to go to uni at that point. Um, so for two years, I, I went out and so, just to see what kind of design jobs yeah. were out there. Um, I did end up working at China Blue for a bit, so right. the yeah, ceramic okay. studio and in the shop doing the displays. So that yeah. was quite creative. It was when I was there, I was like, actually, I'd like to go and do something. Yeah. So more creative and is that I, your forte do you think you know your strong point is uh, the designs like on paper like just yeah. being creative i, I have just, no yeah artistic ability <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the uh just even any choices i make like that would be wrong on a creative project, <laughs> as ollie well knows <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i definitely think being creative like creating something like what I do now so yeah. like posters like logos and yeah. things like that but what led me to graphic design rather than anything else in art and design was um I just searched what kind of jobs were out there because I didn't want to go and do a course that yeah. then didn't like end in a job I wanted okay. to try yeah. and yeah because some people do uni courses and then they don't get jobs in in what mm-hmm. they've done. That so is a very logical I research, choice yeah. because I did. And graphic design came up. So right, graphic okay. designer came up the most. I thought that's the most realistic, yeah. creative job that you can get afterwards. So yeah. And then I went to do foundation degree yeah, in graphic okay. design and production it was. So, mm-hmm. yeah. so what are the challenging bits about your job? What do you struggle to do? I think sometimes initially you'll get a, a brief from yeah. someone and be a... You know, take you a little while to sort yeah. of think of ideas, but you some sometimes you just got to get going with it, yeah. and things come to you. Yeah. And I was going to say writer's block, but it's not, is it? No, it's, it's like block. creative, but like creative block that kind yeah. of creative yeah. like just things aren't coming into your head. You yeah, know? I think, and that's when you really have to knuckle down, just get yeah. something started, and then halfway through that process, you go. Oh, hang light bulb on. moment yeah yeah so if i asked you like so advice for your 15 year old self if you could look back and yeah. have a chat to your 15 year old self what would you say find your passions yeah. and try and li- try and go down those paths yeah um to find, to find your career but you know sometimes life throws other things at you that you follow those yeah. or well, it's really easy to say like to people that follow your dreams and of course for some people they get to other people you know it's a meandering path yeah yeah to, I find my find. way of getting to where I've been is a bit like that yeah um and like depends what like if I didn't take the job at the zoo I probably wouldn't be yeah here now like 15 years ago as a yeah. seasonal so I was only supposed to be here for the summer and I'm here now um so I think as well take the opportunities to get into places yeah, okay. yeah. Rather than just um, applying for jobs, sort of ask for opportunities to go and do work experience to okay. get you yeah. you known. Yeah. Because that's how I got this job. Yeah. So, so volunteer, volunteer, try and help out. Yeah. Volunteer. Give somebody a get hand your, with this project. Get your names in yeah. places and, and yeah. show them what you can do 
as yeah. a volunteer and then they've got you in mind for yeah, when the job a job comes them, up. You know, if you think of all the community groups, I'm yeah. quite sure there's quite a lot of them that would, you know, probably do need a graphic designer or some help with design yeah. things or loads of other tasks as well. Well, thank you very much for talking to us today, Kerry. Mm, I hope okay. that our listeners have enjoyed li- hearing from you. I wouldn't have expected a graphic designer to work at a zoo until I, until I met you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, I but, often get asked, where do you work? I say the zoo and yeah. a graphic designer at the zoo. Oh, and you know, they you get some, yeah, we didn't know they, they weren't there kind of thing. Um, yeah, they expect you to be a zookeeper all the time. Yeah, <laughs> check your fingernails, yeah, make sure you've not got yeah. an animal poo under them. <laughs> yeah. No, well, as Matt said, thank you very much for joining us, Kerry. And obviously, thank you to all our other guests. Hopefully you've enjoyed watching or listening to our podcast, and we hope to see you in our next episode. Thank you so much for listening or watching our podcast. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving us a review, or if you're watching, please hit the like button and leave us a comment about your favourite part of the episode. To get more content from Wild Planet Trust, please consider checking out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there and you can also subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Of course, you can find Wild Planet Trust, Paint and Zoo and Nuki Zoo on all main social media platforms. And we'd really appreciate you checking those out as well. All that's left to say is thank you very much for watching. And of course, we'll see you in the next episode.